Yeah, we back, we back, we back now. Brothers, today's gonna be a different type of video. I know every now and again, we love having a good time. You know, we love cracking jokes. We love talking about the divestors, you know, as a comic relief from the more serious topics that we engage in on my channel. But today's gonna be a different type of video. I know sometimes I tell y'all boys what type of woman to avoid. You already know what type of woman we supposed to avoid. But today, I'm gonna tell you the type of woman that you are, the only type of woman that you're supposed to entertain. If this is not the archetype you're dealing with, my brother, you are wasting your time. You're wasting your time. Now I know the other day I dropped a video entitled The Pro Black Divester Mentality. Now today's video is gonna be the intelligent black woman mentality, the opposite of the divester. Yeah, today we gonna show you boys the opposite of the divester. The only type of woman that you're supposed to deal with, the only type, the only archetype. This is what I call the intelligent black woman. And if I made the comparison to jewelry, you remember in the last couple of videos, I've been making the comparison to jewelry, okay? The intelligent black woman, she's the black diamond. She's that rare gemstone. She's that that elite, you know, limited edition, that limited edition type of jewelry, bruh. You see, when it comes to the divestors, that's that Chinese food jewelry, that corner store Canal Street, $14.99 on Amazon jewelry. That's not the real jewelry. But today, I'm gonna show y'all boys that authentic jewelry. And in today's video, I'm gonna give you a list of 11 different women, 11 different examples of what I call that authentic jewelry. Not that counterfeit, fraudulent, middle of the mall kiosk jewelry. Nah, brother, today we are gonna show love to the real jewelry. Now, before we get started with the list, I wanna visit one of my favorite books that gives you an example of what I'm talking about. Take a look up on the screen. Let's start at the top. News of the subjugation of the Negroes in Guadeloupe soon reached saint omang and set the entire North province aflame with insurrections. The Negroes and mulattoes alike were convinced that Napoleon was playing a perfidious game and that his ultimate goal was the return of the old colonial system of slavery and color distinction. Leclerc was caught in a trap. Again and again, he had solemnly promised that slavery would not be restored, but thenceforth, he could no longer convince anyone in the island that Napoleon would refrain from doing so. My position, he wrote to Napoleon on August 6, 1802. Now, this is what French General Charles Leclerc wrote to Napoleon Bonaparte on August 6, 1802. My position, he wrote to Napoleon, grows trying and may well become worse. Here it is. Disease has made such frightful ravages among my troops that when I wished to disarm the Negroes, an insurrection broke out. Our first attacks drove the insurgents, but they scattered into the other cantons. In the present insurrection, there is a veritable fanaticism. These men may be killed, but they will not surrender. They laugh at death, and it is the same with the women. Now listen, bruh, the French General Charles Leclerc, listen, you heard what he said. These men may be killed, but they will not surrender, and it is the same with the women. Now brother, that's that authentic jewelry that I'm talking about. Those are the black diamonds that I'm talking about, brother. That's the only type of woman that you should be dealing with. You should not be dealing with the divesters and the swirlers and the goofies and the, and the yo, no, hell no. Nah. You only supposed to deal with the intelligent black female archetype. That's it, that's it, that's the that's the number one. You see, take a look up on the screen. You see, you got General Dessaline and his wife and you see the white man down on his knees. You see, listen, unlike the divesters, the intelligent black female, she doesn't get down on her knees for the white man, bruh. She don't get down on her knee. You see, the white man is the one that gets down on his knees, as you can see. Now, let's get into the list. At number one, we got Suzanne Louverture, the wife of Toussaint Louverture. Let's get into it. Suzanne Simone Baptiste Louverture, born in 1742, was the wife of Toussaint Louverture and the dame consort of the French colony of Saint-Domingue. After being a coachman and a driver, Toussaint was freed at the age of 33 and then married Suzanne Simon Baptiste. In 1801, the constitution appointed Toussaint as the governor general of Saint-Domingue and she received the title of Dame Consort. In 1802, French General Charles Leclerc's troops captured her along with her husband and the rest of her immediate family. Now, if you take a look up on the screen, you'll see an old illustration of what is Suzanne Louverture being tortured by the French military during her time in prison when they were trying to extract information out of her regarding her husband's finances, regarding his military plans, regarding his political ambitions. And uh, yeah, due to the fact that Susan Louverture was what I call that authentic, that authentic jewelry, them real black diamonds, she never snitched, she never folded, she never gave an ounce of information to the Europeans. She never spoke to the whites. Nah, hell nah. You see, the divestors, man, they would have been blabbing and spilling and, and fibbing and all type of shit, bro. But see, Susan Louverture, due to the fact that she was that authentic jewelry, she was the real article. Nah, bro. Nah. She stayed down to the end, bro. She stayed down to the end, even though they broke every bone of her body, man. Broke her arm, broke her legs, ripped her fingernails off her hands, all type of nonsense, bro. But she stayed down. 
she stayed down. Take a look up on the screen. Let's read about it. Napoleon Bonaparte sent General Charles Leclerc to apprehend Toussaint Louverture and deport him to the French Alps. Suzanne and her children were transported to Bayonne, where they were placed under the supervision of General Ducot. She was tortured, but never provided any information about her husband. One source notes, when she arrived in prison, she weighed 250 pounds. She only weighed 90 pounds when leaving France. During all the years of torture, she gave a single answer. I will not talk about my husband's business with his torturers. Bruh, that's that authentic jewelry, bruh. That's not that Chinese food Canal Street jewelry. That's the Rolex Submarina, bruh. That's that Rolex Oyster Perpetual. That's that Rolex Explorer. That's that Audemars Piguet. That's that Rolex Yacht Master 2. That's not that Chinese food bullshit jewelry on Amazon for $7.99. That's not that divested jewelry. That's that authentic jewelry. Now, let's continue. Next up on the list, we got Henriette Saint Marc. Take a look up on the screen. This prostitute was hanged by the French in 1802 for spying for the Haitian Revolutionary Army. Let's talk about it. Take a look up on the screen. Henriette Saint Marc died some 217 years ago in 1802. Although she was popular as a prostitute, she gained more popularity after she became a strong ally of the Haitian Revolutionary Army by using her influence on the French to gain access to their plans, their weapons, and their secrets to support Toussaint Louverture and Jean-Jacques Dessalines and the War of Independence. Born to a slave mother who raised her after being neglected by the white official who impregnated her, Henriette grew from humble beginnings with the advantage of being a mulatto woman, which came with the freedom to do as she pleases. Although many mulattoes live within the black community because they were mainly raised by black parents, several of them isolated themselves and identified as white. This gives Henriette's story more cause for celebration after risking her life for the independence of Haiti. By the late 1700s, she was living in Port-au-Prince where the war was ongoing between the French and the freed slaves who had joined the Haitian Revolutionary Army led by Toussaint Louverture. By all standards, Henriette was a beautiful woman. She was described as a striking young lady with a beautiful body and skin who was wanted by all men, especially those who could afford to have her. Being mulatto gave her the advantage of having affairs with some of the French soldiers and eventually the topmost French officials. After a while, she was known as a high-class prostitute who had access to several French and white elites than many other people in Haiti. Henriette was not just a pretty face who used her beauty and charm to enjoy the luxuries in life. She was also very intelligent and attentive to things around her. So after a while of fraternizing with the French elites, the French soldiers, and the French officials, she soon understood the need for Haiti to gain its independence. Her sense of duty scored her an alliance with Dussel Louverture and Jean-Jacques Dessalines, and she became a secret spy for the Haitian Revolutionary Army. Between 1800 and 1802, Henriette leaked whatever information she could retrieve from the French back to Toussaint and his men, which put them at an advantage aside from having a strong military. Not only did she leak information, but she also stole weapons, stole gunpowder, and stole several other documents for the Haitian Revolutionary Army, which helped them immensely. Now, brothers, this is that authentic jewelry. And Henriette Saint Marc, she was one of Dessaline's many, you know, many mistresses, many girlfriends. Dessaline, like I told y'all before, Dessaline had a girlfriend in every town, every city, every province, every commune, every department. Dessaline was that guy. Dessaline was that guy. So Henriette Saint Marc, that was one of Dessaline's little shorties. And yeah, she was putting in that work. She was putting in that work. She wasn't trying to divest. She wasn't trying to get with the white man and thing. Nah, she was trying to get close to the white man so she could double cross him and slice his throat. You see, that's that authentic jewelry. That's that authentic jewelry. And uh, I'm gonna tell y'all towards the end of the video why it's so hard to find that authentic jewelry in the modern day i'm not saying it doesn't exist it still exists for sure it still exists because i have those type of women inside my own family my mother is one of those type of women but i'm gonna tell you why it's hard to find in the modern day stay with me let's continue according to several sources henriette lured french officials into the bush where she would seduce them extract information and wait for the haitian soldiers to finish them off that's that authentic jewelry brother i'm telling you i'm telling you if bro if the woman you dealing with don't got this type of mindset bruh what are you even doing my brother what are you even doing let's continue after a while the french began to realize a number of their men had gone missing as well as the fact that the haitian army was gaining access to their top secrets their plans and their weapons it was then that both henriette and Toussaint Louverture became suspects in june 1802 Toussaint Louverture was arrested by French General Jean-Baptiste Brunet, who had pretended to invite Toussaint Louverture for peace talks. He was sent to France and died in prison. After realizing that there was still heavy leakage of weapons and information, it was ordered that Henriette be arrested and persecuted of armed smuggling after her latest mission of stealing gunpowder to the revolutionaries of Acaé. Before she could be held by Dessalines, the French sentenced her to death by hanging. She was marched to the market square in Port-au-Prince, where she was hanged in broad daylight in front of the church of Guadalbuquet. She was executed at 10 in the morning. 
Now you see brothers The white man he doesn't appreciate He doesn't appreciate the black diamonds He doesn't appreciate that authentic jewelry He wants that middle of the mall kiosk jewelry That Amazon Chinese food jewelry for $14.99 That divestor jewelry He don't like that authentic jewelry You see what he does to the authentic jewelry He hangs the authentic jewelry He persecutes the authentic jewelry He wants to arrest the authentic jewelry He wants to eradicate the authentic jewelry And that's part of the reason why it's so hard to find the authentic jewelry In the modern day I'm gonna get into that towards the end of the video Now let's continue Next up on the list, we got Queen Nanny of the Maroons down in Jamaica. Yeah, let's get into it. Take a look up on the screen. Queen Nanny was an 18th century leader of the Jamaican Maroons. She led a community of formerly enslaved Africans called the Windward Maroons. In the early 18th century, under the leadership of Nanny, the Windward Maroons fought a guerrilla war over many years against the British authorities in the colony of Jamaica. By 1720, Nanny and Quay, her brother, settled and controlled an area in the Blue Mountains. It was later given the name Nanny Town, and it had a strategic location overlooking Stony River with a 900 foot ridge, making a surprise attack by the British very difficult. Nanny Town, placed as it was in the mountains away from European settlements and difficult to assault, it thrived. Nanny limited her attacks on plantations and European settlements and preferred instead to farm and trade peacefully with her neighbors. She did, however, make numerous successful raids to free slaves held on plantations, and it has been widely accepted that her efforts contributed to the escape of almost 1,000 slaves over her lifetime. While Nanny lived, Nanny Town and the Windward Maroons thrived and multiplied. The British colonial administration became embarrassed and threatened by the successes of the Maroons. Plantation owners who were losing slaves and having equipment and crops burned by the Maroon Raiders demanded that the colonial authorities take action. Hunting parties made up of regular British soldiers, militiamen, and mercenaries scoured the Jamaican jungles. Now, brothers, I told y'all, man, the white man, he doesn't appreciate the authentic, the authentic jewelry, bro. You see, he wants to, he wants to hang the authentic jewelry. He wants to eradicate the authentic jewelry. He wants to assassinate the authentic jewelry. Even in this story about Queen Nanny, they over here scouring the Jamaican jungles looking for Queen Nanny so they could arrest her or eradicate her. Bro, I'm telling you, bro. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. But anyways, man, let's continue. Next up on the list, we got Kandaki Amanarinas, Queen Amanarinas from the Kingdom of Kush. Let's get into it. Not wasting no time. Take a look up on the screen. Amanarinas was the queen regent of the Kingdom of Kush from the end of the first century BCE to the beginning of the first century CE. She is known for halting the Roman expansion into Kush in present day Sudan. Now, listen, brothers. This that ancient jewelry, brother. This that, yo, this that ancient jewelry, bro. We're going back in time for real. Let's continue. Queen Amanarinas is one of the most famous Meroitic queens because of her role in leading the Kushite army against the Romans in a war that lasted three years. This war is largely responsible for halting Rome's southward expansion into Africa. After an initial victory against Roman Egypt, the prefect drove the Kushite army from Egypt and established a new Roman frontier. Strabo's account of the Meroitic war led against the Roman Empire includes a queen named Candace. Her name appears on Estella alongside those of Tereticus and Echinidad. But the precise relationship between these three is not entirely clear in the historical record. However, scholars generally consider Akinadad to be her son and Tereticus to be her husband. Yeah, man, give it up one time for the ancient jewelry. <laughs> round of applause, round of applause. Now, next up on the list, we got Euphemi Dagi. Let's get into it. Not wasting no time. Take a look up on the screen. Euphemi Dagi was a Haitian composer and choreographer, the royal mistress of Emperor Jean-Jacques Dessalines and famous for her fearless care of the wounded during the campaign of 1805. Now, similar to Henriette Saint-Marc, Euphemie Dagui, like I told you, Dessaline had a had a little shorty in every single town, every single city, every single neighborhood, every single back block. Man, Dessaline was that guy, for real. The ladies was going crazy over Dessaline. And Euphemie Dagui was one of Dessaline's little shorties, you know, down south. You see, Henriette Saint-Marc, she was she was she was up in Port-au-Prince. You see, that was his shorty up in Port-au-Prince. But Euphemie Dagui, that was Dessaline's shorty down in the south, down in down in the town of Lekai. Now let's continue. Dagui met Dessaline in the town of Lekai during his campaign in southern Haiti where she nursed him during his sickness. Man, Dessaline was spitting game. Dessaline was in the hospital bed spitting game. Oh my goodness. Yo, bruh. Dessaline was that guy, bruh. Imagine you're smack dab in the middle of one of the most intense wars in the history of humanity. You in a damn hospital, you sick, and a beautiful nurse comes in to nurse you back to health. And the first thing on your mind is, yeah, I, I gotta get at that. I gotta, yo, Dessaline was that guy. Let's continue. Her relationship with Dessaline was public and a letter paper was printed with the text, the friend of Jacques his majesty emperor of haiti and she was granted an allowance by the state 
Dagi hosted a salon with the task to spy on the military of Southern Haiti. While Dessaline was still alive, her monthly expenses paid by the state were about 1,000 goods. Upon complaints to Dessaline by Balthazar Ingeniac, the director of state properties for the west of Haiti, her allowance was reduced to 800 piastres. Now listen, listen, Dessaline was my guy, but I, I gotta keep I gotta keep it 100. Dessaline was bugging out for taking money out the state coffers to trick off on one of his little shorties down south. Dessaline, you was bugging out, bro. Dessaline, oh man, listen, Dessaline, my dog, but nah, you bugging out, bro. Dessaline was tricking off with the state money. Oh my goodness, let's continue. But before we continue, I just want to say the reason why Euphemi Dagi was given a task to spy on the southern military of Haiti was because it was actually the southern military of Haiti that created the conspiracy to assassinate Dessaline. You see, in the final months of his life, Dessaline knew that there were plots rising against him. And just like he did with the French during the war with Henriette Saint Marc, he did the same thing with Euphemi Dagui. He gave her the task to infiltrate the circles of the military men down south to, you know, keep a listening ear. Let me know what they're talking about. Let me know what they let me know what they're planning against me. You know what I mean? So yeah, Dessaline was very famous for using his women to you know as spies as agents to commit espionage to get information yeah Dessaline yeah because the women love Dessaline so they'll do anything for Dessaline listen they'll risk their life for Dessaline Henriette St. Mark she died for Dessaline that was one of Dessaline's little shorties yeah that was his shorty on the west coast on the west coast of the country Euphemi Dagi was his shorty on the south of the country so yeah Henriette St. Mark she was hanged in front of the church and Euphemi Dagi she almost got killed too now let's continue when Dessaline was assassinated a mob broke into her house with the intent to lynch her, but she managed to calm them by serving them dessert and singing them songs. She later married one of the prominent members of the Haitian military, La Coude Belle Fleur, of whom she had children with before her relationship with Dessaline. So yeah, man, she was uh she was creeping with Dessaline. She went after Dessaline died, she went back to her baby daddy. You know what I'm saying? She went back to her baby daddy and things like that, you know. Uh yeah, you know, it is what it is, man. Dessaline, you know, rest in peace to Dessaline, man, you know. People don't really understand, you know, we always talk about Dessaline was the revolutionary, but they don't know Dessaline was one of the craziest, Dessaline was one of the most elite players to ever exist, bruh. Now let's continue. Now, next up on the list, we got Dessaline's wife, Marie Claire et was Felicite Bonheur. Now, as you can see, one of my favorite, one of my favorite illustrations of all time, this is when the French surrendered in the winter of 1803. You know, the French had to get on their knees in front of the black man and the black woman, man. Yeah, yeah, man. Yeah, as you can see, you know, Dessaline with the entourage. You see, he got his wife standing next to him on a throne. And then he got another woman right there. You see that lady right there in between the two guards? You see the black man behind him, right? Behind the royal family. And then to Dessaline's left, another guard. And then to his left, a female with a sword. And then behind her is another guard. And then the Frenchman, you know, on his knees. You see, I told you, when it comes to the intelligent black female, it's the white man that gets on his knees. When it comes to the divestors, they're the ones that get on their knees. Now, let's continue. My Claire Eues Felicite de Bonheur was the Empress of Haiti from 1804 to 1806 as the spouse of Jean-Jacques de Saline. During the siege of Jacques Mel in 1800, she made a name for herself for her work for the wounded and starving. She managed to convince Dessaline, who was one of the parties besieging the city, to allow some roads to the city to be open so that the wounded in the city could receive some help. She led a procession of women and children with food, clothes, and medicine back to the city and then arranged for the food to be cooked on the streets. I'm telling you, brother, that's that authentic joy right there, bro. Now let's continue. Next up on the list, we got Maya Louise Quadavid. Yeah. Take a look up on the screen. Queen Maya Louise Quadavid was the queen of the Kingdom of Haiti from 1811 to 1820 as the spouse of King Henry Christophe. During the French invasion, she and her children lived underground until 1803. Now I'm telling you, brother, I told you. This is why I say this is the only archetype of woman that you should be dealing with, brother. That you should be dealing with. I'm telling you. When the white boys came to invade, when they came to wage the war of extermination, Man, she stayed down and she lived underground. She lived. She was. She lived underground. My yo, bro, that's that authentic jewelry, brother. Let's continue. In 1811, Maya Louise was given the title of queen upon the creation of the Kingdom of Haiti. Her new status gave her ceremonial tasks to perform: ladies in waiting, a secretary, and her own court. She took her position very seriously and stated that the title given to her by the nation also gave her responsibilities and duties to perform. She served as the hostess of the ceremonial court life performed at the Sun City Palace. She did not involve herself in the affairs of the state. She was given the position of regent should her son succeed her spouse while still being a minor. However, as the son became of age before the death of his father, this was never to materialize. After the death of the king in 1820, 
She remained with her daughters, Amethyst and Athenair at the palace until they were escorted from it by his followers together with his corpse. After the departure, the palace was attacked and plundered. Maya Louise was described as calm and resigned, but her daughters, especially Athenair, were described as vengeful. Now, Maya Louise, she actually ended up, she lived the rest of her life as an extremely wealthy and powerful woman. She went into exile for the next 30 years after the death of her husband, and I believe she relocated either to uh, England or Italy. And, you know, her husband left her behind a, a very large fortune. Uh, if you transfer it to the currency of today, she inherited a fortune of about 70 million dollars, somewhere between 70 million and 100 million dollars. Right. So she lived the rest of her life in uh, luxury and comfort, even though her husband was gone. But, yeah, man, you know, that's how you got to treat the authentic jewelry, brother. You know, you got to you got to bless the authentic jewelry. You know what I'm saying? So anyway, let's continue. Next up on the list, we got Marie Jean Lamartinière. Another one of Dessaline's little shorties. Bro, I'm telling you, Dessaline, man, Dessaline had a lot of authentic jewelry on his roster, man. Dessaline had a lot of authentic jewelry on his entourage, bro. Dessaline, he was collecting the authentic jewelry. Now, let's continue. Marie Jean Lamartinière was a Haitian soldier and reportedly a dazzling beauty. She served in the Haitian army during the Haitian Revolution from 1791 to 1804. Marie Jean served at the Battle of Cut Apieu in the March of 1802 with her husband, Louis Lamartinière. She fought in a male uniform, standing along the fort's ramparts, bearing both a rifle and a sword. She made a great impression with her fearlessness and courage and was said to use the long rifle to snipe on the wounded French soldiers below with the skill that all the men applauded. When she wasn't fighting, Marie Jean nursed her injured comrades. Now, listen, I repeat, I'm gonna, I'm gonna run that back. I'm gonna run that back in case you didn't hear it. It said, she used the long rifle to snipe on the wounded French soldiers. She used the long rifle to snipe on the wounded French soldiers with a skill that all the men applauded. Bro, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, this is that authentic jewelry. It's not that divested bullshit jewelry. No, brother. No, brother. That's that. Yeah. You heard what? Yo, I got to say it again. She used her long rifle to snipe the wounded French soldiers, bro. Listen, brother. That's that limited edition jewelry right there. Now, let's continue. Her husband, Louis Lamartinière, was killed in battle in 1802. Her life after independence is unknown. An old story says that, for a time, she was involved in a relationship with Emperor Dessaline, who admired her courage, and that she was later married to the officer Jean-Louis Larose. Although unverified, the following account originates from a reliable contemporary source and was recounted by one of the fellow soldiers stationed at Cadapiou. Now, next up on the list, we got Mary Saint Dede Basil. Let's get into it, not wasting no time. Take a look up on the screen. Dede Basile was born near Cap Francais to enslaved parents and made a living serving as a sutler in the army of Dessaline. There are varying accounts of her madness, but according to legend, Dede Basile developed mental illness after she was assaulted by her master at the age of 18. And I'm pretty sure there were many black women during that time who lost their minds during uh, the colonial regime. And let's continue. Now, it's said that she worked as a sutler in the army of Dessaline. A sutler is a civilian merchant who sells provisions to an army in the field, in the camp, or in the quarters. And they follow the army to remote military outposts. Okay, so like I told you, man, Dessaline, I told you. He had a lot of women in his entourage, serving many functions. Now, let's continue. Mary Saint de de Basile is remembered for retrieving and burying the mutilated body of Emperor Dessaline after his assassination. Basile died around 1816 and was buried in Port-au-Prince, but her grave has been lost. She was survived by her several children, including her son, Cardinal Condol Basile, officer of the constabulatory under the Haitian president, Faustin Souluk. Now, next up on the list, we got Victoria Mansu, a.k.a. Adrabayatoya, the woman who raised Dessaline, Dessaline's mother figure. And this goes back to what I say in several of my videos, brothers, the woman that you choose to be the mother of your children, the woman that you choose to raise your children is going to have an immense effect on how your children come out. I'm telling you, because if Dessaline was like I told you, imagine Dessaline was raised by the bullshit jewelry. Imagine he was raised by a divesting, swirling type of goofy. He would never become the man that he became. Because I told you, the mother is the first teacher, the mother is the first nurse, the mother is the one that transmits culture and values to the children. So that's why the woman that you choose to marry, the woman that you choose to, to get pregnant, I'm telling you, it's a major decision to make. Do not take it lightly, brother. Do not choose the wrong woman to raise your children, bro. Now let's get into the story. Adarabayatoya was a Dahomey warrior and a freedom fighter in the army of Dessaline during the Haitian Revolution. 
Before the revolution, she and Dessaline had been enslaved on the same estate, and the two remained close throughout their entire life, with Dessaline calling her his aunt. Mantu is believed to have been born in the kingdom of Daomei in present-day Benin. Some sources indicate that she was a soldier there also. It is unclear precisely when she was abducted and enslaved or when she arrived in Haiti. Before the revolution, Mantu worked alongside Dessaline as a slave on the estate of Henry Duclos. She was described as intelligent and energetic and shared a close relationship with Dessaline and the same hatred towards slavery. Dessaline called her his aunt, which may have reflected their closeness as expressed within the traditions of African diasporic kinship rather than a direct biological link. Mantu was reportedly a skilled warrior, a midwife, and a healer who organized several rebellions before the momentous meeting at Bois Caimans in 1791. In 1804, Dessaline became Emperor of Haiti and he gave Toya the title of Duchess of Haiti. When Toya was dying, the Emperor urged his doctor to save her life, stating that she was his aunt who had shared his sufferings and emotions since before the revolution. She was given a state funeral with a procession of eight sergeants and Empress Marie-Claire Felicité dressed in black between two non-commissioned officers who led the convoy. So yeah man, that's how you gotta, that's the type of, that's the type of honor and veneration you gotta give to the authentic jewelry, bruh. The intelligent black woman, bruh. Not that divested bullshit. The authentic jewelry, bruh. Let's continue. Next up on the list, we got Sanit Belair. Man, one of my favorites, man. Sanit Belair. This that this that real limited edition jewelry right here, brother. I don't even know if this type of jewelry is even still on the market anymore, bruh. I don't even know if this type of jewelry is even still found in the mines anymore, bro. You can't even dig this out of the diamond mines anymore, bro. It's not even it's not even in circulation anymore. Let's continue. Let's talk about Sanit Belair. Take a look up on the screen, my brothers. Sanit Belair was a lieutenant in the army of Toussaint Louverture. She was born in the town of Verret in Haiti. She married Brigadier Commander and General Charles Belair in 1796. She was an active participant in the Haitian Revolution and became a sergeant and later a lieutenant during the conflict against the French troops. In Saint Domingue. Her exact reason for joining the rebel army is never explicitly stated, but it is understood that she wanted to help Haiti claim its independence. She married Brigadier Commander Charles Belair, the nephew of Toussaint Louverture. Together, she and her husband were responsible for the uprising of the entire enslaved population in La Tibonite. Now, time out, brothers, you have to understand. The La Tibonite region in Haiti. Now keep in mind, she was a teenager she was like in her she was like 19 20 years old she was like 18 19 20 years old during this entire time brother she i'm telling you this is that authentic jewelry brother now the artibonite region in haiti that is one of the 10 administrative departments in the entire country it covers an area of about 5,000 square kilometers and she and her husband were responsible for the uprising of that entire region against the french colonial authorities and she was not even 21 years old at the time that's why i told y'all this is that limited edition jewelry that i don't even know if it's still in circulation right now i'm telling you brother let's continue when she was captured along with her husband by the french army she told her beloved husband to die bravely before meeting his death by a firing squad by law the women had to be decapitated but she refused to be taken to the block and blindfolded Sanit forced her executioner's hands, demanding to die by firing squad. She was a soldier after all. Facing imminent death, she fought to die on her own terms and she won. Sanit was killed in front of an audience of enslaved Haitians. Before she was shot to death, she cried out, Vive liberté, à bas esclavage, which meant, long live liberty, down with slavery. Now, brothers, yes, just like Henriette St. Mark, just like Queen Nanny of the Maroons, just like many other women that came before us, I told you brothers, the white boys, they don't like the authentic jewelry. They don't want the black diamonds. They want that divested McDonald's level jewelry. They do not want the real jewelry, brother. They don't, they don't, they don't appreciate the real jewelry because whenever they get in contact with the real jewelry, they want to eradicate the real jewelry. They want to assassinate the real jewelry. They want to persecute the real jewelry. You know, it's crazy, man. It's crazy. But like I told y'all, I'm going to tell you why it is so difficult for black men in the modern day. If you're a black man of a certain caliber, and you're looking for a woman of a certain caliber, I'm going to show you why it's so hard to find that in the modern day. Because you see, our ancestors in the European colonies, and you could even say on the African continent during the era of colonization, we went through a process of indirect selective breeding. What is selective breeding? Selective breeding is scientifically known as artificial selection. It is a controlled breeding process in which individuals with specific desirable traits are chosen as parents to produce offspring with an increased likelihood of inheriting those desired characteristics. 
This method is widely applied in both the animal and plant kingdoms to modify and improve certain traits, including not only physical traits, but also behaviors and personality traits. In the context of behaviors and personality traits, selective breeding involves identifying and favoring individuals that exhibit particular behaviors or temperamental qualities that align with the desired outcome. For example, if we take a look at dogs, Dog breeders, they might select dogs with friendly and calm personalities as parents to enhance those traits in their offspring. Conversely, if a breeder aims to reduce aggressive and rebellious tendencies, they may deliberately avoid breeding individuals with such traits or simply removing them from the bloodline altogether. Over successive generations, the repeated reproduction of individuals with the desired behavior or personality traits can lead to the consolidation and enhancement of these traits within a certain population, as certain behaviors are consistently rewarded while other behaviors are consistently punished. During the era of slavery in the European colonies, as well as colonization on the African continent, individuals who resisted or rebelled were often met with brutal punishments including violence persecution and very often times they were killed and died at a very early age before they were able to start a family and raise children of their own consequently others who displayed more submissive and obedient behaviors were more likely to survive and have many children this survival and reproduction of individuals with certain behavioral traits such as compliance and obedience can be seen as a form of selective breeding in a social context Blacks who were obedient and adapted to colonial rule and obeyed the European authorities or even collaborated with them, they were often favored with certain privileges and survival advantages, while those who resisted or rebelled, they were murdered. That's why I said in a previous video, this is a very limited edition archetype in the modern day for black men to find because white men have made every effort to eradicate these women from existence, similar to their male counterparts, just like the honorable, intelligent, high level black man they try to assassinate that black man too. Every chance they get, they want to eradicate that type of black man. It's the same thing with the black woman, the intelligent black woman, the black diamonds, the real jewelry. It's the same exact thing. They want to eradicate. They want to assassinate. Meanwhile, the collaborator, the traitor, the turncoat, the defector, the divester has always been granted certain luxuries while the authentic elite black woman and the honorable black man were always attacked by the establishment. And even when you take a look at the women in today's video, Henriette St. Mark, the white man killed her at a very early age. Sunny Belair, she was only 21 years old when the white boys killed her, bro. Killed her by firing squad. Queen Nanny of the Maroons. They were, they were scouring the Jamaican jungles trying to kill her. And the list goes on and on and on and on and on. I'm telling you, brother. And like I said before, the mother is the first teacher. The mother is the transmitter of culture and values. But if all the women who have those values to transmit down to the next generation, if they're all killed, then how are you going to transmit those values to the next generation? So, like I told you, man, that, that archetype is going to be hard for you to find. It's going to be very difficult for you to find in the modern day. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. I told you, I would say it's about 5% of the population, bro. 5%. 5% of the women living today are the direct descendants of those legendary women that I mentioned in the video. But 95%. Nah, bro. Nah, bro. It ain't that. It ain't that. And the vast majority of those women in the 5%, they're already married. They're already taken. It's not, they're not on the market in abundance like that, bro. I'm sorry to tell you, bro. I'm sorry. But they do exist. They do exist. But, anyways, man, it's a boy Never Card that's Celine back in the building. Yes, indeed. And I'm gone. Peace. Reincarnated, I'm back in the original fashion. I left on a horse and came back in that ass. And I left with abundance and came back to famine. We used to be pyramids, now we be rapping. Look how the mighty have fallen. Used to be running, now we be walking. When you be cooning, that's when they applauded. Selling your soul, your sons and your daughter. Gotta come up in this shit. They stuck in the mix. Really, my heart would be breaking. That's why I'm stacking that paper and handle my business. Pass it down in generation. Talking about money and power and building a nation. That's a deadly combination. Never be watching the TV, they pushing the genders. Falsifying information. Know they got malice intentions. Step in the room and I'm feeling the tension. Enemy watching me, blocking my vision. Pay for the check, cause I need my redemption. Building my kingdom, I need to protect it. Ready for war like a young money Congo. Never decided the team is the motto. Up in the crib and I'm whipping up waffles. Up in the crib and I'm smoking gelato. I'm chilling, I'm taking my pain and making ambition. I'm blessed by the gods, but I ain't religious. I came for the power.
they came for their bitch. They make a no hourly wage. I got business. This shit is an art, and they could never be taught. Selling my soul, I can never be bought. Play with my money, I see you ain't caught. Run to the check, and I do it for sport. Babylon falling, I go to the source. Packing my luggage and go overseas. Shorty be with me, and she so at least. Shorty be chosen, I'm calling her Hershey. Secret intelligence probably gon' murder me. Don't fuck with brands, cause nigga, I'm Haitian. Say the wrong shit, and you're smacking their faces.